Oh, yeah, so here we are at about 9,000 feet on the south slope of a uh, dormant but not extinct volcano in the uh, Cascade Range. Of course, the trees around here are all Abies Magnifica Shastens. And uh, up there, you get a smattering, like I said, of the white bark pines and uh, also the uh, the mountain hemlocks. And she, uh, dominant ground covers, of course, so does Erica Maria over here and uh, right there. You see that? That's the, that's the Erica Maria. Erica Maria, nice. You got some nice uh, lupinous, very connescent and silvery lupin, Fabaceae. Lupins, how many goddamn species of lupin you got there? I mean, you got those uh, Faboidiae flowers. Not easy, you gotta, the stamens and shit are hidden, of course, in this uh, keel petal. This uh, petal that's kind of buried right there, if you could see it. I mean, you got the, the banner is the top petal. Well, the banner's kind of hidden. Shit. Yeah, the banner. Oh, there's the banner. There you go. There's the So there's the banner. See, it's kind of folded right here in this one. And you got the wing petals on either side. And you got the keel petal right there. And the keel petal, uh, if you were to peel this back, which I can't do because I only got one hand right now because I'm holding the goddamn camera, uh, you'd see the stamens and, uh, you know, the, the filaments and the anthers, the stamens, and then you'd see the stigma there too. Which then leads to that one, the unilocular ovary, which then, of course, matures into a pea pod looking thing, uh, such as you have right here. And these are quite the, they're quite fuzzy. They're quite the, they're quite voluminous. It's covered in all those little trichomes. And these, uh, these lupins are pretty interesting. The seeds on them actually, and some of the species have evolved to look almost exactly like the pebbles of the substrate that the plant grows in. And that's, of course, is a camouflage that prevents. All oh, the chipmunks and rodents and shit from finding them and eating them. I mean, and they blend right in. I mean, you could hold a handful of those, the gravels, you know, from especially on the granites. You know, I've seen this in the desert where the the substrate is all the decomposing granites. And, uh, you know, it's just little granite pebbles. And you, you, hold a, you hold a handful of that soil and you throw some lupin seeds in there, you can't find them. You know, they blend in. They just blend in so good with the pebbles of the decomposing granite. Anyway, here's a nice chance for me to give you a nice up close full front to the cones of the Abies Magnifica variety shistens. You can see they just sit upright on those branches and then all those scales and bricks uh, basically just uh, dehiss and uh, disintegrate. The cones disintegrate on the branches and then uh, the, you know, the seeds of course are embedded in the bracts which acts as kind of a wing to help with the wind dispersal and then they just kind of flutter all over the place and with this shit and uh, you get the uh, you get some new trees popping up so the dominant trees here of course are abies magnifica when we get a little higher we'll see pinus albicollis as well as suga mertensiana or mountain hemlock hey you ever wake up and you say boy i feel kind of polygonaceous huh probably not but uh, if you did live here you might say that you know because po the polygonaceae is a family that's got a lot of diversity at least in this goddamn area and really all over uh, western north america you know, you know, uh, Ariagonum, the wild buckwheats are in that family. Then you get some more polygonums. And you also get this genus, which uh, unfortunately is uh, dead for the, it's, you know, gone back into the ground to its perennial root for the season. Because all the plants are getting ready to close up shop here. Uh, since, you know, it does, it's starting to get cold as hell at night. And, um, you know, they do get dumped on. We'll be under about eight feet of snow in two or three months. Maybe two months if uh, we get the good winter rains. Anyway, this is a conagon de visii. Uh, it's it's a type of knotweed, and you can tell when you look at those. Get up there, look at those nodes. See those nodes? Boom, boom, boom. Oh, this is already dehissed. You know, it's easier. Okay, then now it's easier to see. So you got the nodes and with the shit. It's very fuzzy too. When it comes out, it's a pretty plant. It's easy to uh, confuse with another plant. It's in the Apocynaceae, um, the Cyclodenia humilis. You know, which has a similar kind of thing. Just these, you know, these. Uh, Lone branches that come out, they don't branch too much. These shoots that come out, they don't branch too much. And they got the same, uh, somewhat similar uh, leaf morphology, except on the uh, Cyclodenia, the leaves, of course, are directly opposite each other, like many plants in the Apostanaceae, the milkweed family, are. And now, now the flowers on this one, they do go off. They're, they're tiny, you know, like, like a lot of, you know, polygonaceous flowers in the Polygonaceae. Uh, 
you know, like the, like the buckwheats and shit. They got, they got their small and conspicuous flowers, and they're, I believe they're somewhat sessile. They might have a little pedestal. I can't even find any here. But they're, you know, they're pretty inconspicuous, you know? The flower is maybe a tenth the size of the leaf, if that, probably smaller than it, you know? But, of course, again, there's throw that nice volcanic sand, and there's a nice a perennial uh, root down there. It's what you call an herbaceous, an herbaceous perennial. So, you know, the above ground tissues are baseous, dies every year when it goes dormant, and then it, uh, you know, just comes back from the root. Milkweeds do the same thing. Again, milkweeds are not related to this at all. This is Polygonaceae, and this is Aconagon davisi. Here you go. So, Ariagonum is one of the hardest genera to work with out west because it's, it's so plastic. It's got so many different uh, species. It's got subspecies. It's a very hard plant. But once you know what a wild buckwheat looks like, Again, no relation to the shit you make your pancakes out of. Once you know what one looks like, you're good to go. And again, it's just paying attention to those flowers. You know, so you got technically what's called an umbel of flowers. Dainty little ass flowers, too. <clears throat> All clustered together. Sometimes they got a pedestal. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they got a stipe. Sometimes they don't. Want to blow your mind. Uh, read about the morphology of the flowers. These are really, they could be really tricky to differentiate what species you're looking at you know you look at it and you know it's a buckwheat but uh you try to pick out species next thing you know you're booking extra therapy appointments grinding your teeth at night and having trouble sleeping next thing you know after that you know uh, you got a job uh working at a gas station because you've spent all your money and you know you know we're being stressed out trying to figure out what the shit kind of areogonum you're looking at It'll keep you awake at night that is if you give a shit so here's uh this is areogonum pyrolofolium over here you got another species of uh areogonum no idea. You know, this is one of the genera I'll see, and I'll just say, hey, it's an Ariagon. I'm not even going to fuck with it, because it's just too it's too tricky. It could be too hard, you know? Another Ariagonum there. And a lot of them have that same thing going on. A Cespitos mat like that with just a little little flowering shoots sticking up. But then, of course, uh, when you know, when you see that cluster of flowers at the top, you figure out what's going on. Here's another Ariagonum over here. Got quite a few different areogonums. And again, this is Polygonaceae 2, same family. Polygonaceous. And you get a lot of Polygonaceae diversity in the tropics. Don't believe you get too much of the areogonums, though. Again, the areogonums are mostly restricted to the arid west and southwest uh, of uh, North America. They like the rocky the rocky deserts and the, the summer dry sites. Or relatively summer dry. Okay, and then since we're speaking of... Uh, you know, uh, autoerotic asphyxiation. Never mind. I'm sorry. It's something different. I was talking about that with someone else. Uh, this, uh, since we're talking about Polygonaceae, he's another lovely genus and species. Uh, this is a somewhat rare one. Only uh, occurs on this mountain, as far as I know. Uh, that's in the Polygonaceae family. This is Polygonum shastens. Look at this dainty little bastard. The plant kind of looks like it's been shaved. You know? Maybe there was a pica, and you do get them up here, or some shit, uh, non- not on the goddamn branches. I don't know. Who knows? Maybe it's just had kind of a rough year and it's been windblown, you know, dehissed some of its leaves. Or maybe it's just a relatively old plant, maybe 10 years. And uh, the only leaves it's got on it are the ones that it just put on uh, this year. Regardless, it's it's quite beautiful. The leaves are blue. And uh, there you go. There's those polygonaceous flowers, those tiny ass flowers. Tiny, tiny flowers. See that? You know, and it's inconspicuous, easy to just step over or step on, like many of these idiots that come up here do now when they're just taking selfies and ignoring all the plants around them. Uh, so, you know, it's easy to miss. But again, it's a rare, it's a rare plant. Who knows how, uh, how long ago it emerged as a species? Who knows how long it's been on this uh, little island in the sky, this volcanic island up here at 9,000 feet. Just growing right amongst the lupin, and uh, you know a soil that's basically just, just volcanic, uh, just volcanic uh, sediments. You know, basically andesitic sediments that have just weathered and eroded. Hey, you get little hints of pumice in here. You get so get a couple little hints of pumice, and with this shit. But uh, yeah, again, it's mostly a uh, mostly andesitic uh, rock. It's just you know, remember that in intermediate in silica composition. It's somewhere between rhyolite and basalt uh, on the extrusive uh, igneous uh, rock dungeon scale. 
I don't know why I always got to make everything a dungeon. Something, something's wrong with me. I think something happened to me as a kid, you know, that made me like this. That's probably, at least that's what the shrink says. Who knows? I don't know. I don't really give a shit either way. Well, look at a nice, uh, look at the foliage on that red fur. It's so soft. It's so soft and blue and nice. And then again, they just get dumped on here. Uh, you know, as long as we're not in the drought, we get dumped on with the snow. You know, you'd be under eight, ten feet of snow, maybe more, in the winter. And it lasts on up until June or July. And, you know, during the drought we were in, the snow almost was completely gone off Shasta. Shasta looked naked. It was kind of odd. But the last couple years have been good, and I, I believe it's had snow throughout the whole year. And I think they got a glacier up there, too. At least on the north side. Who knows how long that's going to be there for. Man, I do got to say that this Ariagonum pyrolifolium looks remarkably similar, both in the leaf surface texture, uh, you know, the, the general uh, umble, the, the inflorescence, color and shape, uh, to the one to one that I've seen about a thousand miles away from here uh, in the serpentine deserts of Baja California, sir. You know? But, uh... But it's obviously not. They're far too disjunct. That is far away from each other to have much of a close relationship. I mean, they're in the same genus, but, you know, I doubt that. Uh, I, I bet they diverged a long time ago. So it's probably a case of parallel evolution or just convergent uh, in, you know, the way that they resemble each other. You know, that bright green glabrous leaf structure. You know, the genes are just probably already there in the genus, uh, ready to get shuffled about. And so, uh, you know, they probably just, at least I would assume, you get two species in the same genus that look alike, even though they're not as closely related as one would have in originally think, or initially think. And again, it's just because uh, the same, you know, the, the Ariagonum genes, they got genes to evolve that, uh, many separate times am i confusing you to shit am i confusing the shit out of you on this you know it might be confusing and it's fine but i suggest you look it up it's interesting shit you should get that uh carl zimmer evolution textbook he talks about all that shit you know but you know like in the the genus streptanthus for instance uh i believe the serpentine thing the tolerance for serpentine of which the genus streptanthus is uh many of the genera are readily adapted to i believe uh it's evolved many times like four or five times in the genus so just because one species is over here is adapted to serpentine soil harsh toxic soil doesn't mean that this other species that also grows on serpentine soil over here uh diverged from the same lineage you know they could both be mo they could both be more closely related to species that didn't that don't tolerate serpentine soil than they are to each other, and that's just called convergent evolution, you know, parallel evolution. But it's occurring within a genus, you know, and that might be what's going on with that buckwheat. That might be why it looks like uh, the species in Baja California, sir. Who knows? Anyway, I feel something biting me in my ass. It might be one of those yellow jacks. I should probably check it out. You know, funny I should mention Streptanthus because actually as I was, I was, I was just going on that disjointed rambling rant that probably fucked your head up more than it explained anything to you. I was actually standing on top of a, what appears to be a Streptanthus, certainly a Brassicaceae right now. There you go. There's the flower. You can see why they call it a jewel flower over there. Little four-petaled Corolla. Got kind of a fat bowling pin shape to it. And they're biennials too. So here's the first year seedling. And then, oh, you know what? That here's and here's the inflorescences. Typical Brassicaceae, kale family uh, inflorescence. And there you got the salique. Remember the fruits are called the salique. So there's the fruit. Uh, that's uh, probably got about 20 to 40 seeds in it. You know, and they got a lot of streptanthus have this kind of rubbery texture to the leaves. You know, and this is a genus that's immensely successful. It's all over California. It's all over the West. You know, you get another closely related genera in, called Colanthus, you know, which some, some might know as the desert candle. They look real weird. They can get upwards of three feet tall, got a hollow stem, yellow stem. The flowers are closer to the stem. Real impressive plant. You know, and many of these, the streptanthus, can get strikingly gorgeous as well. That's why they call them the jewel flowers. 
See that bastard right there? Ah, it's kind of pretty. It's kind of pretty for a, a dainty little shit. Perfoliate leaves. And again, like most brassica flowers, you got the four petals. And I don't know. I wonder what species this is. We'll find out. Could be a a member of the tortuosus complex, Streptanthus tortuosus. That seems all around. It seems to be growing around here. I've seen that a bunch recently. And again, the Salix on the straps are pretty flat, whereas you know Salix on the Colanthus are rounded. They're cylindrical. Or maybe it might. Is that vice versa? I don't know. Oh yeah, there you go. See, there's the there's the seeds. On them. But these don't look mature. I wonder why this is splitting open already. I bet that's good pica food. I bet the pikas love this. You hear those little bastards, you know? You just They live on the rocks, but they tend to live higher up. You know, and you don't even know they're around you and you hear a little beep. They sound like some sort of weird frog or something. But they're uh, actually a close relative of rabbits, I believe. Here's a, here's a pretty nice one. There's only a couple. Normally you'll see a lot more. But this is a Pulsatia occidentalis. And it looks pretty fucking weird, doesn't it? Again, these are not the flowers, though. And these are actually uh, the clusters of seeds. See, there you can go. There you go. And uh, somebody's just helping wind dispersal. You know, and they look somewhat similar to the uh, Akeens you see on many of the Rosaceae, like Cercocarpus and uh, uh, Persia. And, uh, oh, look, there's one of the cool Castileas. The paintbrush is a... Uh, going dormant too bad when this is going off that's a real nice one it's a hemiparasite so it photosynthesizes but it also steals a little bit of energy probably from this uh, rabbit brush up there it's a member of the sunflower family by the way the rabbit brush anyway so there's you can see that conical uh, receptacle and a goddamn pulsatia here's the seeds look like, look like they're just uh, just maturing Again, it's in a, the, quote, buttercup family. What an unfortunate common name. Uh, hey there, buttercup. Well, it kind of makes me want to throw up. Uh, actually, there was a buttercup cafe where we used to have our union meetings back in the day. But, uh, you know, that was when Jack London Square used to be real nice, filled with all the crackheads and adult bookstores and had a real sleazy vibe to it. Kept the more uh, uh, elitist and bourgeois riffraff away. Anyway, so here's, uh, here's the leaves on it. Real lacy and nice. Anemone is in the same family. I believe this used to be in a genus anemone. I, I don't quote me on it. Again, Ranunculaceae, which I believe is one of the more basal lineages of angiosperms. It's a, a herbaceous perennial. The top dies back and, you know, just comes back from a little uh, underground rhizome every year. Doing fine here in the uh, volcanic sand, the uh, andesitic sand of... Oh, here's a nice, here's a nice big ass colony of that Pulsatia occidentalis. Look at that. A Dr. Seuss plant. Doesn't it look like one of those, what do they call them, the truffula trees? You know, when you're trying to teach, when it, when, when a Theodore Geisel was trying to teach uh, the little kids about, you know, how uh, the corporate overlords are going to basically do what they've been doing the past 70 years since that book was written. Uh, that was the Lorax, by the way. You know, since they've been doing what they've been doing the past 70 years since that book was written, written and uh, just, you know, denuding the planet's forest for, uh, uh, to generate profit and personal gain since, uh, you know, many members of the species place no value on anything that doesn't directly benefit people. Anyway, uh, so here you go. There's more of those wonderful flower heads. The little poofy balls, which remember those are just the plumosa dispersal mechanisms attached to uh, each seed the lacy foliage it must be a nice uh, tuberous thick taproot down there too maybe not a tuber but certainly thick i mean you gotta gotta remember these leaves are gathering all the uh, sunlight creating carbohydrates and what this shit stashing them down there in the root so that when they go dormant for six or seven months which is about what the growing season is uh, or the dormant season is here you know when they're buried beneath 10 feet of snow they could just pop right back up again once this volcanic talus soil heats up, you know, around uh, June or July. So anyway, you guys are prepping to go to sleep, huh? Hope you have a nice, uh, a nice slumber.
Yeah, there you go. There's a nice money shot of the, uh, those plumose dispersal mechanisms on the Akins right there. Nice. Yeah, see, there's more of that Akinagon, that Polygon SA, that now we going off. See, this still got some juice in it. Probably because we're, we're in a wash right now, you know, which is the same reason that this, uh, this here Arnica viscosa is going off. You know Arnica, you know the, 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 the fucking bag bomb? You know, the nice uh, creams and ointments, and they sell it in overpriced health food stores. It's just a, it does something for your skin, I guess. I don't know. I think it does. Maybe it helps with your muscles, you know? This in the CBD. You get some of the CBD. You go on like a 10-mile run, rub some of this on your ass, you know, and take some of the CBD tincture. Maybe you'll be fine. I don't know. I've never done that, really. I just kind of try to try to stretch after a long run, you know? Anyway, I don't know what the shit I'm talking about. Here we go. Arnica viscosa. You can see uh, it's heavily glandular. See the little hairs? Little hairs with the glands. Oh, yeah. Smells really nice. See, look at all the oil it's putting on my hands, too. See how shimmery that is? That's not because I properly moisturized before I went on this damn hike up this mountain. It's just, this is all just now from touching this here arnica. And again, it's done flowering now, but when it is going off, the flowers are yellow. I'm putting on quite a show. What is this guy doing? Get out of here. Come on, man. There's the Akeens. Remember the seeds of the sunflower family are called Akeens. Akeens or Sipsila. And Akeen is just a one-seeded fruit. So one of these is technically a fruit. You know, remember because you have a composite flower head on the asteraceae. See, it is. Technically, it's 30 or 40 flowers aggregated into one compound. Uh, capitula is the name for it. And of course, you got these, these green ridged bracts here are called the filleries, the phyleries, however you want to pronounce it, doesn't really matter to me, tomato, tomato, and they completely circumscribe the uh, involucre, right? the, the phyleries compose the involucre, which of course, the, the involucre goes all the way around the uh, capitula. So capitula is just what you call what looks like a flower of the sunflower family, but it's actually composed of many different flowers. And again, there's the Okeens. That white shit is called the Pappus. That's just the dandelion fuzz, thought to be a modified calyx. That is technically modified sepals. But, uh, you know, a lot of the sunflower family members obviously just use it to help their Akeens disperse and get around. You know, and they can be for wind dispersal or they can be kind of barbed to help get into the... Uh, you know, attached to the fur of a passing animal or a, a passing a, a human being. Oh, nice rock outcropping. We got some interesting shit going on here. Here's a species of Ethereum. Flip it over. When I need a ferns, you got to flip them over and look at the undersides. See what's going on. A lot of the Ethereums are pretty common uh, throughout the Northern Hemisphere. And, uh, you know, you'll see the same species on both the East and West Coast. They get around. You got those tiny spores. So let's look at the, let's look at this, uh, the back side of these really quick. You can see those sori up under there. And unlike the Pteridaceae, which the next plant I'm going to show you is a member of, uh, these do not have these margins, that is the leaf edges that are rolled under, that are incurled. You just got straight, uh, straight bands of sori there. See those little black clusters? And it's where the magic happens. It's where the, uh, the spores come out. So, you know, a lot of the ferns can be pretty hard to figure out just what the shit you're looking at. Uh, being that there's no flower, of course. You kind of, you just got to, I guess, go with the, you know, the, the leaf morphology and then flip that, that bastard over. Look at a, the story on the underside. This one, of course, is an entirely different family. This is Pteridaceae. Is a family here. And this is Cryptogramma. It's actually got dimorphic leaves. It's got two different kinds of leaves, which you can see. If I can get this, the shadow's kind of fucking me up here. There you go. See, so there's the, there's the uh, sterile fronds right here. This guy, yeah, just rip a little piece off. He's fine. He's doing fine up here. They're about to go dormant for the season anyway. There's the sterile fronds. Quite, quite lovely and quite beautiful. You get a nice money. You should get up close. And then here is the, uh, the fertile fronds. And you can clearly see how the margins of those leaves are curled over, forming a little lip, protecting the spores, that that uh, pseudo-enduzium, 
where most a lot of ferns have an enthusiasm, especially a scale covering on their sori. Uh, the sori, of course, being where the spores come out. The teradaceae does not have an enthusiasm. They just got the, the edges of the leaflets just tend to curl over like that. Can you see that? Can you see that up close? Is that good? There you go. That's a nice one. Nice shot right there. Oh, yeah, so there's that, uh, there's that Arnica again, Arnica viscosa, not only from uh, Mount Chastain. I think you got some up there by Crater Lake, which is a similar volcanic rocky habitat uh, going on over there. There you go. Can't see him. Well, you can see him a little bit. Discoid flowers. And just look at the glance on those. Remember that? I was basically giving this thing a rub down and just uh, picking up all the oils and shit. It's really nice. I stuffed some in my shirt because it smelled good. We'll see if I have an allergic reaction to it and break out in hives. Uh, anyway, here's a, another another nice plant, another uh, pretty widely distributed. This is a species of hollow discus, rose family, rosaceae. Look at those leaves. You get up close, you can see they're in a margin. Well, actually, this one doesn't have it. Normally, the rose family members have a dentate margin that is a toothed leaf edge. This don't have it too much. You get up close, look at those those little flower, uh, I think it's a panicle, and you see, uh, you see all the goddamn, hey, I mean, dozens of stamens, multiple stamens, and, uh, yeah, it kind of looks like a mini rose flower. If I can get this, oh, yeah, there you go. See that? Hollow disc is this color. Ocean spray is the common name. Just like that high fructose corn syrup, uh, cranberry drink flavored beverage everybody was drinking in the 90s. I remember my friends used to get that thrown in their lunch packs when they'd go to school. We'd sit in those formica tables and throw shit at each other, frequently get in trouble, have to be removed from the classroom, and uh, they'd always have that in their lunch pack. You ever been beamed in the head with a uh, with a plastic bottle full of ocean spray disgusting cranberry juice, the high fructose corn syrup blend? Ah, the shit they used to feed us in the 80s. How disgusting. In the 80s and 90s, you know? Just so much goddamn sugar. No wonder you got an entire generation that's basically sedentary and lethargic. Anyway, there's Ocean Spray. Real nice goddamn plant. Rose family, Rosaceae, driving up here at 9,000 feet. Oh, yeah, here we go. Up on a nice rock outcroppings. We'll see what's going on up there. It looks pretty good. Could be pretty good. You get a much different environment than you get down here. Oh, it sounds like one of the hippies has got a didgeridoo or something. That's pretty terrible. Oh, yeah. Anyway, what we got going on? Oh, look at it. Oh, yeah, you got the hollow disc. It's got some, uh, well, you got something, something ericoid, probably a phyllodoce, phyllodose. Nice potentilla up there, rosaceae. White bark pines going out of the rocks. Look at this tortured rock. All just volcanic, all just relatively new rock, recently spewed out the mountain. Here we go, nice member of the sunflower family, the Eupatoria tribe specifically, Agrathena occidentalis. Almost done, almost finishing up here. Just growing on the rocks. Oh, what's that fern up there? Room with the Penstem and David Sony eye. Look at those goddamn lichens on those rocks too. So there you go, there's that nice uh, nice close up Agratina. Agratina accidentalis. Sunflower family Asteraceae, Eupatoria tribe. You can see it's just loving the rocks. Just growing out of the rocks. Happy as a pig and shit. Happy as a clam. Very beautiful flowers, too. Oh, yeah. Get up there and look at that. I believe these are somewhat closely allied with the genus Stevia. Or uh, at least they just look like it. Tiny discoid flowers. Discoid florets clustered in a capitula of about, I don't know, five to eight florets. Stevia's got a similar thing going on, but instead it's got four to five floors per capitula. And see, there is a single capitula right there. See that? 
See that guy? One single capitula, one single flower head with about nine individual florets in it. And agratina is really good for demonstrating the overall morphology of the sunflower family. You know, you can really see the individual florets up close and personal. Doesn't have any daisy rays, no ligules. It is discoid flowers. It's just got the disc flowers. And little arrow shaped leaves. What a nice plant. Oh, yeah, you like the rock habit? Look at this Philodoce Brewery. Philodose. I'm going to pronounce it like it's some sort of a wonderful Italian uh, entree. Philodoce. Philodoce. Anyway, there you go. This Philodose Brewery. Eric Casey, he just he totally ensconced in this rock. Just exploiting the cracks in the anisite. Blueberry family, Heath family, acid lovers. Are you fucking kidding me? One of these fucking new age hippers, hippies has a bell out there? You get all these goofballs coming to the mountain because they think there's aliens that live inside it. You know, meanwhile, the native people been here for 15,000 years and they don't, they, they don't want to come see a bunch of dreadlocked white people taking a bath in their goddamn uh, spring over there. You know, these goofy bastards. I don't know why you got to fetishize shit. Why you got to make it about, you know, magic and say all this goofy shit plants talk to you and blah, blah. And, you know, it, it just, just respect it for what it is. Just why is it got to have some sort of mythology around it? Some mystery. You got to fetishize it you know turn it into some weird cult it's kind of what they do you know i mean i'm glad they're out here enjoying it and it always could be worse it could be rednecks and atvs tearing shit up and you know just mindlessly blowing shit up sipping monster energy drinks and eating beef jerky and just blowing shit up out you know what it's go it could always be worse you know if there's one thing life has taught me but jesus christ i just uh you know it gets kind of weird they come out here for their solstice parties and they they have the orgies and the, they do the uh, sex trains and whatever i don't know what the fuck they're doing over there but apparently someone's got a bell and they're, they're bringing a bell and uh you know just kind of creating a weird uh new age ambiance for the rest of us that might not want to hear hey who gives a shit it could always be worse like i said you just find it mildly uh, trifling and somewhat amusing oh yeah nice lichen and daigle lichen just slowly eating away at the rock then you got a species of black lichen too anyway here's a pretty common one when you get the areas with very cold winters and higher latitudes this is juniperus communis common juniper it smells pretty good doesn't have any berries on it but uh, i do like the smell get up there and look at that foliage. look at that, those nice white the uh, white cuticle wax see that the waxy covering wonder how old this is probably a few hundred years Oh yeah, not gonna lie. Oh, I'm kind of winded. It's kicked my ass a little bit up here, nine thousand feet. You know. Oh Jesus Christ. Oh yeah, now it looks like the the pumice rock they used to have in front of the, the McDonald's over there in Schiller Park on the west side. Oh, remember that as a kid. Why is it yellow? I wonder if it's got some sulfur in it. Remember that as a kid. You know, I think I threw up in their little uh, outdoor playpen once. Oh shit. And uh, just remember to hit his pumice in the landscaping. You know, could have been from here. Who knows? Maybe it was from here. Oh, yeah. Anyway, onward. Here we go. Oh, yeah. Nice breeze up here. Real nice breeze. Look at all that plated anisite. Oh, Jesus Christ. I'm walking at the pace of a 70-year-old man. Doesn't help that your feet sink into the pumice, too. Oh, God. Where the pike is at? Who knows where the pike is? I bet they're here. I bet you little dainty bastards can hear me. You little adorable guys. Oh. You gotta go to Mexico to get the cheap inhalers. This is what you gotta do to circumvent the, the pharmaceutical companies. You know, I thought about just going down there, stopping Ensenada on my way down to Baja, you know, buy about 40 inhalers. You know, maybe up the price about three or four bucks, sell them for ten bucks to, uh, you know, comp for the the gas and the, uh, you know, any uh, expenses and what the shit. Maybe buy yourself a couple of tacos, but 
but still keep them cheap. Oh yeah, I said my asthmas, <laughs> asthmatics tend to have a harder time at the uh, higher elevations. Yeah, it feels pretty good though, it does. Look at that over there. Damn, I wonder if that's up at 14,000 feet. That, that just might be the top of Shastina. That might only be 10,000 feet. I don't know. We'll see. Oh, yeah. Look at that. There you go. There's the top of the mountain. Nice. It's probably at least 10,000 feet. Maybe four. Maybe it's 14,000. The mountain is 14,000 feet tall. It's just hard to believe it ends right there. Now, you know what? I guess it looks about 3,000 feet of elevation gain. Back on the pumice. And over here is one of the target plants for today. Member of the sunflower family. Hosea Nana. Oh yeah, look at that. It's a pretty nice view. It's pretty good. You can get up in there and see. You get your discoid flowers. Heavily glandular. Very hairy. Very hairy and glandular. Scapose. A little basal rosetta leaves and then a single flower head coming up from each little uh each little rosette. Ask Tracy, how does it do it? How do they do that? Look at the phyleries on this bastard, too. Rather long. Rather long and, and uh, somewhat recurved. It's goddamn impressive. How about that? Last time I seen this was maybe, I don't know, four years ago. Didn't know what the shit it was. Just seen it was the only thing growing up here besides the white bark pines way up and it loves that pumice I've only ever seen it growing on a pumice and I believe it's a, a listed rare plant too yeah there it is just landscape of pumice only thing growing on it pretty much the only thing growing on it what is it what does this stuff look like when it comes out the volcano huh? say it don't spray it does it just look like little uh, the volcanoes just spitting you know just spattering. Oh, that Areogonimus here. Pyrolifolium. Oh, shit. That was a hike. Pretty cool landscape, though. What's it look like beneath? Yeah, once you get, once you dig a little bit, all the hard, the, the bigger stuff is up top. When you dig a little bit, it's just a very fine-grained little uh, patch of sand. <laughs> patch of sand. I mean, it's that's what the soil is basically. It's just basically pure mineral, uh, decomposed and uh, crushed pumice. And that's uh, that's what all these plants are growing out of. Oh, yeah, here's a nice one. Caleb Tritium, look at that. Montiaceae. And if you guess that it looks like it's in Caryophyllales from those pigments, you'd be right. Anyway, Montiaceae, same family as uh, Louisia, Bitterroot. God, the color on this is just fucking striking. Here's that uh, Polygonum again, right there. So the common name for this is Pussy Paws, which uh, I kind of didn't even want to mention, but I guess I should. Just a way of somewhat revolting and a obnoxious common name, whatever. You know, I didn't name it. But now you know, you know. If anything, it's just a, for sociological purposes just to see how silly people can be. Anyway, is it those basil rose, that's the leaves. Oh, yeah. Prominent veins, real weird, real weird shaped leaves, huh? And it's, there's a, you know, it's purple, but there's chlorophyll, there's chlorophyll in there. You know, beneath all those, uh, I don't know if they're betalane pigments, like the rest of Karyophyllales, or like much of Karyophyllales, not all of that order has them. Betalane pigments, of course, being a, uh, one of the apomorphies for some of the Karyophyllales, you know, it's basically just the red pigments. It's named after beets. Because it's the red red pigments you get in a beets, cactus, amaranth, what the shit. At least I think it's an amaranth. Oh shit, how about that? Real nice.
Uh, yeah, up here looking like the surface of Mars. Here we got it. Well, first off, we got the two crickets banging right there. How about that? How romantic. Then over here, you got a species of Agoceros. Chicory tribe of the Asteraceae. Just looking like a little dandelion, you know? Nothing too fancy. You know, nothing too fancy, nothing too magical. But still impressive nonetheless. Since this has got to be such a pain in the ass of an environment uh, to, to grow up on. You know, and I haven't seen any of the, the hippie rock stacks that I normally see. I always try to knock those over when I do see them. You know, unless it's like an important marker uh, so someone doesn't lose their way. Uh, you know, a rock can or something. But I, even then, I might even, you know, knock them over or whatever. Just kind of obnoxious to see. Anyway, here's another one of those. Oh, gosh, as you can see, there's just a, a gosh, so They're just sticking out, sticking out the ground. Little flat leaves, somewhat inconspicuous. Leaves, of course, are a response to the harsh exposure by, uh, well, I think they're covered in a bunch of little tiny hairs, and then, of course, they got some pigmentation in them. Some of those are red and purple pigments that uh, reduce the effects of the ultraviolet light. So, yeah, pretty good. It's, it's, it's pretty impressive, you know? It's like as impressive as a 20-minute deep dish pizza. What's up? You got a thing for little guys? Yeah, I kind of admire that. That's really nice of you, you know. A lot of people like to go, you know, a lot of, a lot of people like to go for the, the uh, at least the same size, whatever. You, you kind of, you know, you got a thing for, uh, you know, smaller size the uh, partners. That's that's okay with me. I'm not judging. I'm just curious, you know. Are you guys now? What's going on here? Are you gonna? How do you know I'm not gonna eat you? I mean, I'm not gonna. But oh, are you taking a shit? Really? Why are you doing that? That's kind of gross. I don't, you know, I don't need to see that. I don't know why you did that. That's kind of disturbing. I'm going to pretend I didn't see that. And it will just stare at the uh, uh, water vapor uh, moving around a mountain right there. That's pretty nice. Yeah, and I believe that's the top since we're at about 9,200 feet right now. So that's uh, it's about 14,000 feet up there. God damn, that's a big basin. Look at that. That's huge. Wonder if this was a crater at one point. Anyway, in that snow drift, you got what's called a watermelon snow. The infamous watermelon snow, Chlamydomonas nivalis, actually a species of a unicellular green algae. Uh, so it's not a cyanobacteria. It's actually one of the true green algae. It's a eukaryote, but it's uh, unicellular. And it's found all over the world. You know, that, that red pigment is just, <clears throat> it's basically one, probably a carotenoid pigment that that, uh, that species carries in its, uh, and it's the tissue it produces in its uh, cells to protect it from uh, the harsh exposure up here at that, you know, 9,200 feet. And it's generally gross. It grows in the Alps. It's, it's all over the world. Anywhere you get high altitude snow, pretty much. But there's a but what if there's a bunch up there too? Probably. Anyway, pretty interesting. Again, it's Chlamydomonas novalis. And I only remember that because I said it the uh, well, I probably have Asperger's, that's how I remember it. But also I uh, you know said it a couple times. And I've been seeing it a lot this summer at the higher elevations and what the shit. So looking down off this ridge at that base, so you can see all the white bark pines. I think the red firs might have tapered off. There might be a couple down there. Pumice landscape. You can see all the uh, agasaurus, little hulsias poking out and what the shit. No idea what type of grass that is. If that's a carex or a grass or what. I got to be honest. I, I ignore the shit out of the graminoids. I just don't care. I'm sorry. Don't care yet. You know, they've had their time in the sun. They're everywhere. You know, there's, I don't know, maybe one day, you know, when I'm like 70 years old and uh, I've reached that level of boring. <laughs> no offense. I'm sorry. Don't take offense. Someone's going to leave me some uh, some mean words now. Write me a nasty email. Anyway. Multicolored pumice, rainbow pumice. Again, probably less than a thousand-year-old rock. No idea when this blew up. Shastina over there is the active one. Uh, actual Mount Shasta has not been uh, active in quite some time. There's different layers of layers of magma that have cooled. 
and from subsequent eruptions. Yeah, there you go. There's a nice Krumholtz uh, windblown white bark pine, Pinus albicaulis. Remember, these can get upwards of 40 feet tall, but up here, of course, it's a little bit rougher of a go of it. They get they're just blasted by the wind, and of course, they're the storms. It's got to be somewhat of a gnarly place to be during a storm. Probably get struck by lightning a lot. Uh, again, here's that uh, fulgurite I'm showing you, and you can just get up close and see. It basically looks like a, yeah, it looks kind of like a roofing tar, except it's like a a glassy mineral and then you could just kind of pick little parts of it off so it's just a thin outer layer of glass on the outside of this pumice here you know and i'm thinking since we are near the town of mount shasta where they do have a lot of the, the new age hippies you could probably just take some rocks take some pumice and slap some roofing tar on there and sell it in the crystal shops for about sixty dollars a, a piece you know sixty dollars a bang you get some money you know tell them it's good for something it's got some healing properties en energy vibrations and recovering with this shit and they probably buy it up can't get enough of that pine several cones though no cones on it though huh okay so here we have a nice example to point out that a krumholtz habit see doesn't bother getting much tall because it'll just get blown back knocked back by the wind die back and with the shit and just ends up growing growing horizontally growing laterally trunk comes up the ground right there and uh and just kind of does its thing growing to the left that's probably a 900 year old tree right there you know when when they do have cones if that if these were producing cones this year it's not a mass year for cones and seed now, there'd be a shit ton of clark's nutcrackers around and they have a very interesting relationship uh, with the white bark pines with the pinus albicollis you know they'll, they'll harvest all the seeds they go stash them somewhere they're a corvid, so they're real smart. They, you know, they, they remember where they stash these things, you know. But of course, they end up, uh, they end up uh, forgetting where they, where half of them are, or just not giving a shit enough to go back. So then, that by doing that, they plant new trees, you know. Or if one of the one of the the Clark's nutcrackers gets murked, then everything that thing planted, you know, murked by a hawk or something, then everything that that uh, that uh, nutcracker planted uh, ends up just sprouting and turning into a new tree. So you know, they're kind of ensuring their own food source they eat half of them and then they uh, you know further the generations and by uh, further the future generations by planting the seeds and with the shit tree planter birds scrub jays do that with coast live oak acorns too pretty interesting well, here's a cyclodenia humilis a pastanaceae and i set some of the seeds out for you so you can see what they look like pull them right out of this little follicle right here it looks like a milkweed fruit doesn't it it's because they're in the same family a pastanaceae like i said and it's uh this is a pretty weird plant it's got you know, it's got scattered populations that are, uh, you know, far apart from each other with nothing in between. There's also a population in the Santa Lucias, down there in the uh, Los Padres National Forest off the California coast. Just catching some before sunset here on a mountain. Might take it. Might take some of these follicles with me and go disperse them, uh, you know, further down. There's one still going. He's not. He's not done yet for the season. And again, they got a. Uh, perennial uh, rhizome down there that they emerge from every year but uh they just didn't get too big here probably because you know these probably just came out the ground at uh hey shit i don't know probably june probably june or july probably not even june probably july it's a short growing season up here up here now we're about 8500 feet oh yeah look at that ridge up there look at it look at it the uh, little sawback over there it's sawtooth ridge Anyway, I feel like it's, uh, I feel content to go down. I don't need to fucking be up here anymore. I feel kind of lightheaded. The altitude sure whooped my ass. But one last thing I want to show you. This rock has been struck by lightning many times, being that it's the highest thing around, uh, you know, except I guess that rock over there and then just the summit of the mountain. But regardless, when this, this uh, pumice, this scoria does get uh, struck by the lightning, you can see it melts the rock and making it uh, kind of glassy. And I guess the, the technical name for that is fulgurite. But uh, you could see it there. You could see it there. You could see it right there. And you could see it over there, too. And again, that's just the, you know, however many, however much heat is generated when a giant lightning bolt strikes us. And it seems like it's happened many times. It doesn't, uh, it's not too hard to believe. Again, since this is the most, uh, the highest thing up here. A friend was telling me, Mount Thielsen up there in Oregon, which is a much more jagged peak than old Shasta, uh, has been struck by lightning many times. You get the same thing going on up there. You know, especially, I think they, somebody said they caught the lightning, uh, the lightning rod of the Cascades. 
God damn, it hurts to kneel on this shit. So there you go, fulgurite. Just glassy. Oh, yeah. There you go. See, there's more of it. See? Look at how glassy. God damn. It's, yeah, I mean, it just, it feels exactly like glass. You know, it feels like obsidian. Which I, I guess is basically what it is. It got melted again, then it cooled really fast. It didn't form a crystal structure. How many times has this thing been struck by lightning? All those people who tell you lightning never strikes the same place twice, I think it's just bullshit, you know? You see, it came through here too. Came through this, came through this little crack. This whole thing's been heated up so many times. And just melted it. Just melts the outer surface. Boom. What you think about that? Jack, you like that? Isn't that pretty weird? Huh? Aren't you glad we've never been struck by lightning? There's always a first time. We almost did a couple months ago in New Mexico. You want to get out of here? All right, that's all I got for tonight. Hope you had a, day. Hope you had a nice time. Hope you have a lovely evening. Go fuck yourself. Goodbye.